There are so many questions relating to the true relationship between Russian President Vladimir Putin and the Wagner Group. We find out more from the Deputy Defence Minister of the Czech Republic, Tomas Kopeshny, who is also the envoy for the reconstruction of Ukraine. Welcome, sir. Good morning. Well, uh, Putin has named a man called Sadoi as the actual commander of the Wagner Group. What can you tell us about Sadoi? Well, it is part of a broader reconfiguration of how Wagner Group operates and will be operating from the mutiny on. So um, w when we put aside the very events uh, on the Saturday where the whole world was watching uh, whether the Wagner Group will actually finish its march on Moscow, um, <clears throat> uh, there has been quite a substantial silence after uh, the mutiny or the presumed coup d'etat or however we will be able to analyze it later. Um, and this silence has brought into play many speculations. Uh, but if we stay away from speculations and just look at what is happening with the troops, with the more than 20,000 people who have been ma amassed and ready to be deployed by the Afghanist Prigozhin command, whatever he deemed fit, including um, the territory of Russia. So when we look at how they are postured now, it's become quite clear that um, it is no longer Yevgeny Prigozhin who is uh, the actual commander in force, not only on paper, but also in reality. So there are basically three uh, streams or three different ways of, of the operations of Wagner Group as we know it. Um, first is the continuation of their operations and engagement in uh, in the temporarily occupied parts of Ukraine in the Don Donbass region. Second, it is indeed in Belarus, around which most of the speculations were. And third is its long-term uh, and sort of cradle uh, initiative and involvement that it is in Africa. So we have been hearing many, many words from Prigozhin and his successor in, in command about the engagement in Africa, its renewed focus on Africa. Um, uh, but we need to keep in mind that they are really involved in all three of these uh, theatres of operation. What more can you tell us about Sadoi or Greyhead? Who is he? Well, he comes from the structures. Um, it's It's sort of not a mystery man, but it, it's 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 not a big name that we would notice before. Um, and he comes from the, from the structures uh, that are much more closely linked with the um, faithful um, league or faithful stream of thinking within the Russian military, uh, but about himself and what, what he will represent, it's it's really far too early to say. And um, to be honest, I don't have much information about his um, actual intentions that would be anyhow, say, um, different from, uh, from the overall command uh, that is still, uh, for, for many, um, in an unexpected move under, under Shoigu. Mm. Uh, with Gerasimov, it's a different story, but uh, the, the the very fact that uh, that Sho Shoigu still holds on the command of the Ministry of Defense and on appointing his people uh, in the high structures uh, of the Russian military is of significance. So, is he uh, is his name Andrei Trushev? I is that correct? I, I'm just checking. Well. Honestly, that, that's mm. that's what I read, but I, I can't mm. confirm. It's, mm. it, it's possible that it, it is his real name, but I don't know. So Putin has gone from a denying uh, that Wagner officially exists uh, uh, to uh, admitting that a, a billion dollars a year was, was paid to Wagner. Uh, how much more clarity is there now on the direct links between uh, the Russian government and Wagner? 
Well, if you notice one thing when observing uh, Russia and Russian leadership and its military command structures for a while, it's that they only reveal reality or truth uh, when they are in safe harbors, uh, when when they have succeeded in their plans. So, you know, in Europe, we have been seeing this for decades. Um, in Ukraine, we have been seeing this at least since 2014, uh, when, um, you know, it was the little green man and uh, unmarked uh, military personnel who, who started the occupation of Crimea, who, who started the, the aggression against um, against Donbass region, that is two regions in the east of Ukraine. Um, but only after several years has Putin himself admitted in a TV interview broadcasted to the whole world that those were actually Russian military officials who just took down uh, their insignia, which is, of course, uh, completely in opposition to all all the rules of engagement of any, any military in the world. Um, now, what we see uh, with the relationship with the Wagner group now is um, something very similar. When there is a success, uh, Putin himself is very happy to claim it. <laughs> uh, when there is a trouble, he distances himself. And it's not only about himself, uh, Putin as president of the Russian Federation, but also it's about the gover governing clique of, or the, of the elites around him. So um, what we can say is that uh, it's not a reliable source of information just to follow what the, the current uh, Russian president or the clique around him is saying about Wagner, but to follow their practical engagements. We have had a very unique chance yeah. to look into the thinking and also active and real engagement of Wagner Group um, of, during the past or the, during the last uh, few weeks, maybe a few months before the mutiny. Uh, because that's when Prigozhin started to appeal to the Russian pop population, to to the soldiers of Russian Federation's army, military. And that's also when he started to reveal who they really were, how they were engaged in several countries in Africa. He even revealed the map with concrete countries where they had um, contractors on active duty, whether they, where they had consultancy, where they had uh, businesses like occupying uh, mines and others. And he also revealed um, that, of course, everybody was noticing the dissatisfaction with the Russian command, uh, but he also revealed the very um, economic model of existence of, of Wagner Group, which was later confirmed during the raid on his household in St. Petersburg. Um, so if I would sum it up in one sentence, um, the relationship between Putin uh, president of Russia and the Wagner group now is in obscurity uh, until there is a success that he could claim. But the operations that we can discuss of what they do and how they are engaged in Africa and elsewhere, they still continue in the same uh, way of um, doing business as they as this were, as they were started actually uh, several years ago. What about the activities of the propaganda arm uh, owned by? the former leader of Wagner, uh, internet research, as, uh, uh, internet, the Internet Research Agency? Well, it is a continuation of um, their other activities that are more visible by other means. Um, so to quote Clausewitz, or yeah, to quote Clausewitz, for instance, um, war is politics by other means, propaganda or information operation or psychological operations are a continuation of of kinetical warfare by other means. And um, it is precisely between the, the realm of politics or international relations and diplomacy and kinetic fighting because it is already um, streaming the information in a way that completely disregards any interest in truth or reality and lies. Uh, the sole purpose of dissemination of this kind of information is to address and attack, or depending on the word, but address and um, claim the minds of the target audience. Uh, so whatever 
the former lead of Wagner was having was in full coordination with the state organs of the Russian Federation um, that couldn't simply plausibly uh, do this uh, on their own. And um, uh, this is something that uh, can be troubling. Uh, at the same time, uh, it is quite readable when you understand the basic principles. So if we if we could um, turn this into um, a simple statement, uh, the the propaganda is uh, like special forces of uh, what Ria Novosti and and uh, Sputnik News and other outlets are doing officially. Um, they can hire uh, hackers. IT specialists who uh, will then do illegal activities. Um, and precisely like with the Wagner Group itself, dissociate with them. So again, it's a continuation of the same thing that Wagner is doing kinetically, killing people. Uh, but here, to put it um, explicitly, um, they uh, form psychological operation, operational command, uh, to um, not to kill, uh, but to influence um, target audiences. Can you give us the latest on the war between Russia and the Ukraine? Well, we have been observing long, well, several months long uh, initiation of the counteroffensive of the Ukrainian troops. Um, it is still in the stages of field shaping battlefield shaping, meaning uh, along the line of 1,200 kilometers, uh, there are continuous attempts to penetrate the first line of defense, but also to understand properly the technological state of affairs of the opponent. This goes for both the Ukrainian military, especially in the Southern Operational Command, as well as for the Russian military uh, in the in the northeastern operational command, so um, it's not uh, a stalemate. It's not a trench war yet. It's really battlefield shaping, um, and it can go on for for another weeks or months uh, before we could see a really a major uh, large scale counter offensive with using a larger number of troops because that's what we haven't seen so. Would you venture a prediction as to how that counteroffensive could play out? Um, it is quite possible that there will be a breakthrough um, in some of the commands. Um, it is also quite possible that, improbable, that it will not lead to the complete liberation of the Kuwait territory of Ukraine this year. Um, and after this counteroffensive, there will be time for regrouping of the troops of Ukraine as well as Russia. So it will really go in these cycles. Um, of course, it's it's art we're talking about. It's not precise science where you just need to figure out the formula to get to the result. So so this is art that involves uh, people. Uh, so it can turn either way, but. Structurally, what we can say and what we can observe is that Ukraine has the operational upper hand for some time now. Uh, their tactics has been improving ever since the beginning of the war. They have scored numerous successes. Um, they still can and do outplay Russians um, in many fields that were deemed uh, Russian game or Russian theater, uh, like electronic warfare, um, which is... Um, Quite noticeable, and of course, it's it's the biggest, however, tra however tragic uh, playbook uh, around which all the future studies of war and and security will turn around. What has this done to Putin's personal position? Well, the war itself has not done too much of a damage to the position, um, because. It's not really about the, the reality on the ground. It's not really about the successes in the field. It's about how you sell it, how, how you market it to the people, um, to the broader 
population um, in Russia, as well as, and this is even more important, to the governing clique, to the to the elites around uh, around Putin in Kremlin in Moscow. Now, little has done such a devastating damage to the perception of Putin as Prigozhin's mutiny. Mm-hmm. It's like in this fairy tale we know um, uh, emperor's new clothes. <laughs> uh, so there is at the end of this story there is a little girl who sees uh, the emperor for what he is that he is not wearing any clothes at all and so he, she shouts the emperor is naked so we haven't seen that girl yet um, we have seen uh, Prigozhin being that little girl uh, but stopping uh, on the way to the parade uh, but uh, clearly uh, someone has shouted these words uh, in Moscow and uh, you could have seen it uh, during the mutiny on the number of private flights who were getting out of Moscow of the numerous elites, oligarchs, members of parliaments uh, who didn't believe that Moscow could stand against um, you know, a relatively small number of soldiers, so 10 to 20,000. So um, also the fact that, that Putin himself rarely does show up and clearly uses um, doubles or, or the, mm, mm. Um, other people representing him. So it's something uh, that is noted, uh, that is known, um, but for several reasons, for many reasons, still the governmental elite has no better option than to go on with the current president. Well, you probably uh, have seen that he has now decided not to come to South Africa for the BRICS summit. Do you, from where are you sitting, do you think he ever intended getting on a plane and flying to South Africa? Well, from where I sit and from what we know and what we experience in direct interaction with Russia for many, many years, and I'm not talking decades, I'm talking even if just for the past 10, 15 years, which is the, the current regime, uh, I am convinced that he really wanted to show up and he really wanted to show the world that the rules uh, imposed uh, by the international community, uh, as he perceives it, uh, don't apply to him. Because that's what he does. He always gets away with things that are somewhat written or deemed undoable. So he gets away with an invasion to Georgia the neighboring country south of Russia in 2008. He gets away quite gloriously with occupying Crimea in the Black Sea and attacking Ukraine through these illegal unmarked soldiers of Russian Federation um, in Donbass in 2014. He gets away with so many things. It's also quite visible in sports. So when you look at sports, uh, not and I don't mean... Now this, uh, say, uh, political discussion about whether Russian sportsmen should be allowed to different uh, to different sports, games, and events. But I mean, you know, we have experienced this here uh, in the 1970s, 80s, and it's still quite visible in the international arena. Uh, if there is one country and one state that has super elaborate organization of um, supporting uh, its sportsmen on an organ- organized level uh, with uh, illegal substances during mm-hmm. all events like Olympics. It's Russia. And we have had the same here. So all our sportsmen um, in the 70s, 80s, uh, they had to go through the same procedures, uh, through the same, you know, drug uh, uses and uh, um, all sorts of uh, other chemical substances um, improvements uh, to their bodies so they would win. So this is something that is quite noticeable and not even the United States, not even China, you know, do so much of doping as as, 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 as the Russian sportsmen um, statistically. Uh, so the complete and utter disregard for rules because they feel like they, and the state, and Putin himself especially, feels like they, they should not be bound by any rules also explains why why they really desperately were pushing all over Africa in so many countries. And we were observing this 
um, to change the minds, especially of the South African government, but also of other partner countries, and to explain to them that uh, this is a story about an evil West, former colonial empires against a liberator, whereas it's 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 especially um, um, sort of funny and uh, and also cynical for Czechs. So Czech Republic, Czechia is a country in the middle of Europe. We used to be occupied by Russia for forty years. For twenty years, we have here we have we had had here one hundred and forty soldiers stationed in Czechia in a country of ten million with their families. You know, doing the usual occupiers stuff, not behaving very nicely. Um, like classical colonial empire, that is where Russia is. And yet, whenever we follow them and we see how they engage in Africa uh, with countries with whom we try to develop really eye-to-eye relationship, like even to even, they always have this rhetorics of um, fight against colonialism and fight for equality. Whereas... You know, when we hear this, as be have, having been occupied by them for decades, and you know, Poles mm. in Poland they had been occupied for for centuries, it's quite cynical, and that's that's another thing that they get, they get away with. You know, they can claim that they are the force of support against colonialism, and yet yeah. they are the biggest practitioner of colonialism in, especially since the sixties. You know, since the decolonization of the Western empires. Um, yeah. So, one sentence, and sorry for the long answers again. Yeah. Uh, yes, I believe he really wanted to be there because he felt he will get away with whatever is going on in Ukraine and he will just reestablish the former influence of USSR in Africa also by showing that you know Africa is on his side. Our president, Cyril Ramaphosa, was convinced that if President Putin uh, were arrested in South Africa, that Russia would declare war and that South Africa would be nuked. Uh, do, do you think that would have happened? No, I mean, first, like, without no cultural context, just statistically, 96% of all Russian troops from all over the world, like they had these bases, they used to have these bases in Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, in this, in the in the Central Asian countries, in Armenia, they are they are gone. They are all in Ukraine. 96% of all their troops are in Ukraine. They have no more troops, let alone new carriers, let alone ballistic missiles. They could be used anywhere else than in Ukraine right now. So no, I don't. I think it's technically impossible that they would be able to launch another war. I mean, they would not be able to launch a war against a tiny nation of five million, let alone a superpower in on the continent such as South Africa. So no. Um and second, um besides the fact that they, they have no more troops that they could use, they even use, you know, um they even use equipment that their companies were supposed to repair and overhaul for customers such as India. So I don't know um if you notice, but the whole last year we could be seeing equipment that, for instance, that the Indian army has sent to Russia for repairs or other even countries from Africa sent to Russia for maintenance, repairs, overhauls. And then we could see these equipment in the battlefield used by the Russian military. So, of course, the, the, the customers never got them back. <laughs> um, but, um, but the second thing is... Uh, mm. No, they, they 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 would not do that. I mean, it's 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 the classical, it's called chicken game in international pay, relations theory or game theory, and it's it's based on a stupid um, fun the, the American teenagers from wealthy families used to have in nineteen fifties, and it's that you basically have two cars riding next uh, to to a cliff, and the first one who jumps out is a chicken, is a coward, um, and in this case there is no cliff. You know, there is maybe a painting, a blurry painting of a cliff somewhere on a on a on a on a road uh, on a on, on on a normal road that that is fully safe and secure. Uh, there is no cliff. So, you know, for the past five hundred days, many countries in Europe have been have been playing this chicken game with Russia. I give you our example. You know, Czechia, Poland, other countries. So we have been threatened like 
every second day of being nuked, of being uh, uh, annihilated, of being attacked, of, of having no future. Like you name it, you you, you just can't uh, find a category with which we w- wouldn't be threatened. And yet, again, they were not able. They were not even able to hit a single train, to sing, to hit a single truck. Not in Czech territory or Poland, but in Ukraine, coming from Czechia, coming from Poland. So if there is one thing nobody should be worried about, that's, uh, that, that Russia would take it on him. Of course, the tragedy of the Ukrainian people shows that it bears terrible cost on Ukraine. But as we can see, there is nothing else that Russia can do besides struggling for two regions. And that, that's the official goal now two regions to be fully occupied by Russia. And they they were not able to do that in, in 500 days. Um, so whatever the excuse or the worries um, could be put on table, a fear of Russia is not one that people should be worried about. Thank you. That was the Czech Republic's Deputy Defense Minister, Thomas Kopechny, and the envoy for the reconstruction of Ukraine, talking to Biz News about Putin's non-attendance at the BRIC summit in South Africa, the war in the Ukraine, and the Wagner Group's operations. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you.